Hello, and welcome to the Think JSAL webinar series, brought to you by the Office for Strategic Engagements at the Joint Special Operations University. Today, we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAL network. Please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the United States government, the Department of Defense, the U.S. Special Operations Command, and the Joint Special Operations University. If you have questions after the session, please email thinkjsal at jsal.edu. Hello, I'm Dr. Jeff Rogg, an assistant professor at Joint Special Operations University, and I'm pleased to be joined by a panel today on the Israel-Hamas war and the wider ramifications for it in the world. Uh, I'm joined by Dr. Namrata Goswami, who is a prolific independent researcher with a PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Her research interests include planning and forecasting, alternate futures, international politics, South Asia, the roots of ethnicity, identity and interstate conflicts, conflict prevention, management, and resolution. As adjunct faculty at the Joint Special Operations University, Dr. Goswami explores the subjects of violent extremist organizations as well as the future of special operations. Dr. David DiOrio is a retired captain in the U.S. Navy and a national security professional with a PhD in public policy and administration from Walden University. He served as the deputy director at Joint Forces Staff College of the National Defense University. As adjunct faculty at the, special, at the Joint Special Operations University, Dr. DiOrio explores the subject of the Middle East, particularly Iran and non-state groups. Mr. Peter, Peter Cloutier is a foreign service officer with USAID and resident faculty at Joint Special Operations University, specializing in development and human security. He has 20 years of overseas experience directing U.S. technical programs and advising host country leadership in Mozambique, Afghanistan, Angola, and Timor-Leste. So I'd like to begin this panel with a pun that I accidentally thought of. And that's, it's very easy for us to get both strategic and tactical tunnel vision as the United States. And again, no pun intended, but in the case of the Israel-Hamas war, it's easy to focus in on it and not pay attention to the broader geopolitical uh, ramifications of the war. So to start, uh, I'd like to appeal to each of your subject matter expertise and what are you seeing as far as the regions in which you've been interested in, the actors you're interested in, your research interests are in, as far as how they're being affected and interacting with the Israel-Hamas war? So please, Dr. Goswami, if you'd begin. Sure, uh, thank you, Jeff, and it's an honor to be on this panel. So if you look at the wider geopolitical ramifications of the conflict, so while it has a lot of uh, Middle East impact, for example, the nations in the Middle East itself, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, who are part of the Abraham Accords and how they are responding. And you also see how Saudi Arabia is now actually not moving away from the Abraham Accords, which probably Hamas was interested in, in kind of derailing it. But if you look at the larger geopolitical impact, so let's take South Asia. So one of the major countries in South Asia is India. And India is actually quite an interesting study when you look at how it's responding to this conflict. So right after October 7, when the Hamas attacks occurred, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweeted saying that this is an absolute aberration and an act of terror. And more importantly, if you look at Indian media conversations and India's position at the level of the United Nations General Assembly, India has abstained from calling for a humanitarian ceasefire saying that the draft did not uh, basically deplore Hamas attack to the extent India wanted. The Indian media and the general strategic community has been supportive of Israel and very uh, upset with what happened with on October 7. This is a deviation historically because Indians had tended to support the Palestinian cause. So that's one in terms of India. The other major country is China. So if you look at China's responses, uh, why I, what I find so fascinating is that one of the way you can understand the Chinese response is, of course, official statement is that China wants to remain neutral, uh, is calling for uh, very careful targeting, is looking critical of how Israel is conducting the war. But if you look at online discourses, which I saw, what is fascinating is that in some of the online maps, Israel seems to have been removed 
from those maps and Palestine has been reimposed. So you can see that both these nations, which are major powers in the system, are reacting in very opposite ways when historically they were on the other side of the aisle. That's very helpful as far as situating the conflict within great power competition. And uh, continuing along that vein, you know, there's other actors, and I know, Dr. Diorio, that you've specialized in Iran. Um, perhaps you can provide some context on how Iran is involved in the current conflict. Yeah, and I'll take, uh, uh, I'll extend what uh, uh, Professor Goswami was, was talking about with uh, India. With, with Iran, uh, if you take a look at 2023, especially in the early part, um, Iran uh, was taking uh, part in negotiations with Saudi Arabia to reduce tensions, particularly aligned with the Yemen, uh, Yemeni war. And there were facilitators in there from both Oman and Iraq, and China was involved as well because um, interesting to watch China, as Professor talked about, because China sees Iran as a key ally in extending their Belt and Road Initiative uh, into the area, uh, both for access to, to energy resources and as a leading role of, of uh, uh, lines of communication um, into uh, particularly the, the, the Persian Gulf and beyond. So, so China has a vested interest in, in, in ensuring peace uh, comes to the area and they facilitated this dialogue between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And the outcome was basically an acknowledgement, a normalization of relations that hadn't occurred in uh, in years, certainly between Iran and Saudi Arabia to reduce, uh, to reduce tension um, and to uh, have Saudi Arabia recognize the sovereignty of Iran. That was, that was uh, from the Iranian perspective, when they want to exert influence, that, that was a good move for them. But, but something then very interesting happened in the summertime when the crown prince of Saudi Arabia uh, Mohammed uh, bin uh, Salman started talking about normalizing uh, relations with Israel as an extension of the Abraham Accords. And that is absolutely contrary to where Iran wants to go to exert their influence. They see Israel as the last bastion of, of Western influence in that part of the world. They want to eliminate, you know, they've been very vocal in stating they want to eliminate Israel. They want to push Western influence out of the area. So that kind of a move um, and comment by the crown prince really rubbed uh, Iran uh, the wrong way. And you saw a bunch of activity within the Iranian threat network, which, is, which are the network of proxies in the area, uh, of trying to undermine that kind of dialogue, that kind of rhetoric. And I think uh, if, you, if you look at the is Israeli-Hamas conflict, that perhaps may be the culmination of, of the undermining um, effort by Iran to go forward. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer, we don't know exactly how involved Iran was with the planning and execution of the uh, Aqsa storm initiative by Hamas, uh, Hamas, but it really doesn't matter because certainly they were involved with uh, training, equipping, uh, and providing guidance and preparing uh, for, for such a conflict, which was in their interest to undermine those negotiations that went on with Saudi Arabia. So clearly uh, they were involved and those fault lines exist. Um, now it really becomes a matter of where this thing uh, ends and, and who comes out uh, more favorable. Is it Iran uh, pushing their initiative to exert influence and push the Western influence out? Or do we stand strong um, and hold the line uh, to to uh, uh, support um, you know the state of Israel certainly for right but also the, the the Western lines of communication in and out of the area so that that's kind of what's at stake and and uh, and certainly it's a, it's a factor to consider as we drill down further. It's fascinating how you see normalization working at cross purposes with uh, Saudi Arabia in the middle and the tug of war between Israel and Iran, who are adversaries. And so to see that the conflict is actually uh, playing out within the broader uh, diplomatic initiatives of both countries, and that the end state will very much is still contingent and up in the air, um, it's, it's going to be uh, probably one of the most important things to pay attention to as far as what happens to the broader map of the Middle East um, and which way Saudi Arabia moves towards normalization, which country they move towards. Um, Mr. Cloutier, so we looked at state actors, but a lot of your career has been focused in development and really the non-state actors, uh, civilians and citizens and institutions within countries. How would you relate that 
non-state feature as far as say what's going on with information and where public opinion is shifting in some of the countries in which you have experience? Uh, great question. Um, you know, I, I, it's, it's natural to think about the regional, uh, the regional actors and international actors uh, that, that uh, the two other panelists have talked about uh, in, in, in great detail. Um, looking within the country and in, in the, the, the political struggles that have been going on within Israel itself, you know, that's, you know, that's where as a foreign service officer, you know, I, I gravitate to as being sort of the upstream factors that are driving a lot of, of the regional positions that are taking place and that have taken place for, for many decades. And you start with the distinction between the president and the prime minister. I mean, that that's not something that we deal with here, but that's something that 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 with their coalition government they have to deal with uh, in terms of what platforms are are being projected and who's winning those battles within country. The Knesset, the legislative body, you know, far more extensive control over the executive branch um, than perhaps we're accustomed to. You know, and I think about. Uh, it, going inwards and, and, and going sorry outwards to an extent you know i think of the just the 2023 history and taking a few snippets from that i mean the begin this time last year the international court of justice acknowledging a request from the u.n general assembly for an advisory opinion on the legal consequences arising from the israeli occupation of palestinian territory so you know the shockwaves that come out from that in israel itself you know Occupying what? This is our this is our homeland. What are you talking about? And this is a long going, you know, this is a long going saga that goes back, uh, you know, for decades within within the United Nations. But then you look at what sort of effect that has within the United Nations in terms of voting: ninety eight approved, seventeen against, fifty two abstained, twenty six absent. That's quite a that's quite a diverse set of, of of data you've got there. But of the 17 that were against, I mean, three are compacts of free, have compacts of free association with the United States, federal states of Micronesia, Republic of the Marshall Islands, Palau, okay? Um, also close allies, Canada, Australia, Germany, Israel won, of course. So even that 17 number might be slightly inflated. Um, and then you look at what the, what happens after that, the Jenin, incur the Jenin incursions that took place between January and July. Uh, a refugee camp where, you know, they're explicitly going targeting militants within the refugee camps, um, you know, and having a lot of of emphasis behind that. Um, you know, meanwhile, the opposition party, yes, a tid um, as part of its ideological platform, two states for two people with the opposition leader himself stating we're not looking for a happy marriage with the Palestinians, but for a divorce agreement we can live with. But then you look at popular polling now that has come out just within the past month, and you see Benny Gantz uh, appeal soaring with uh, with with the population. You see Netanyahu and um, Etid slumping. So you know this is what's going on in the country and what 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 people believe. You mentioned disinformation, malinformation, and you're hearing over and over again. No one knows what they can believe. I mean, did. Were, did Hamas commit atrocities or not? I mean, ex existential questions like that. On the flip side, you know, genocidal postures in, 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 in retaliation um, coming from uh, the Palestinian voice. So, I mean, you're seeing opportunities for engagement there in the non-state uh, and the non-state realm that can have huge implications. I mean, who's voting for the Knesset? The population is. And so this is where the the human security needs, you know, become uh, become important. So I'll stop there. No, thank you, uh, Peter. And Golda Meir wrote a fantastic article in Foreign Affairs in 1973, which I'd encourage the audience to read, in which she uh, quoted Voltaire, which is interesting because of his anti-Semitic history, and said that as long as people can be convinced to believe absurdities, they can be convinced to commit atrocities. And, you know, we've certainly seen that, and that's one of the concerns. She also said in that piece that Israel has its hawks and its doves, as you pointed out, but it refuses to play the role of a clay pigeon. And so that brings up uh, the, the other related piece, because we're looking you know, focus is very much on Israel and Hamas, but there's that concern with the northern border region and another non-state actor, Hezbollah. 
And so, uh, Dr. Goswami, as far as a non-state actor, Hezbollah is arguably, it's more powerful than Hamas. It presents a greater threat to Israel. What are the chances, do you, do you think, for either uh, conventional conflict to spill out on the northern border as opposed to, you know, sort of this, the back and forth, very low threshold conflict that's going on right now, or for a miscalculation to result in major escalation uh, between Israel and Hezbollah? So that's a great question, especially because one of Hamas' uh, major leader was assassinated just a few days ago. So that brings that particular question to the fore. So when I look at some of the statements coming out of Iran, and including from Nasrallah, Hezbollah's uh, leader, I don't think they're looking for escalation in the conflict because of the larger ramification. So if you look at Iran's strategy, I mean, Hezbollah was basically founded by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards in 1982, if you remember. So in that context, what Iran is actually hoping to achieve, as was mentioned by our panelists, is to ensure that the normalization with the other countries do not take place. In that context, what Iran is signaling, and if you recall, there was an Islamic State attack on uh, Soleimani's uh, day of uh, Iranian general when they were commemorating his death. And ISIS immediately claimed uh, responsibility. And the biggest concern was that Iran would misperceive this as an attack by Israel and that there could be escalation in conflict, right? So that context has to be kept in mind. What does Iran want? Iran wants, in my perception, and I could be wrong, an asymmetric, unconventional warfare that limits the uh, movement towards normalization and not to have any kind of direct, uh, how would I, attribution is the word, like in cyber. It doesn't want to be attributed to the acts of uh, violence and terror, including with the Houthis in Yemen. To come to your question about Hezbollah. So if you look at the signals from Hezbollah as well, and as you mentioned, I think sometimes when we designate groups as terrorist groups, we kind of, the general public perception is that these are not armies or militaries, but they are. So if you look at is the IDF, the uh, Israeli Defense Forces categorization of Hezbollah and Hamas, they don't call them terrorist groups. They call them non-state actor armies. So they are mostly armies who are heavily armed, uh, trained, they have about 30,000 uh, active duty personnel uh, as per the data. And so in that context, I would argue that while I could not, I cannot see the escalation in conventional conflict between them, I would say that the possibility of uh, uh, all border uh, conflict that could have that kind of cumulative effect on Israel is, a, is very much a possibility. Hezbollah has already lost about 300 of its uh, military actors in the conflict uh, due to Israeli strikes. And so there is all that uh, incentive for Hezbollah to escalate the conflict to the level that it's going to start sending out its, its it, it has about 150 missiles, uh, 50,000 missiles in its cache. And so it's already attacked a base, a military base. So that kind of escalation is possible, but not all out conventional conflict in my perception. And Dr. Diorio, uh, Dr. Gosmami mentioned a few things, and these are areas that you focused on as far as the relationship between Iran, Hezbollah, and then the Israel-Hamas war, but also the Houthis. And so the Houthis have been launching missiles at Israel, but this sort of brings in the role of the United States as well. Um, you know, the United States positioned itself very quickly after October 7th, uh, repositioned forces and moved force posture towards the region. What's the interrelationship here between the Houthis, the Iranians, and then now what we're seeing is this emerging, perhaps, uh, coalition led by the United States um, in in the the region, uh, both against Hezbollah, perhaps on the Mediterranean side, and then uh, more towards the Arabian Peninsula uh, against the Houthis. Yeah, so I I agree completely with the professor's uh, assertion that um, the the risk of escalation to general war in the area is is very low, and the reason is that that's not what the Iranian strategy is. The, the Iranian strategy uh, working within the gray zone, you know, that duality between peace and war using a pro using the proxies to to advance their interests is to move continue to move the goalposts with with all that activity. 
incrementally moving the goalposts. Going to general war, they know they can't uh, hold up to the, the Western uh, um, powers with, with a general conflict. So that's not where, where they want to go. But they certainly do want to continue to isolate Israel. They want to uh, reduce our Western influence in the region. And moving the goalposts is important. The thing that we're seeing this time with all the different actors, which is really a different level, is many instruments of, of national power being implemented through the proxies. And, and let me explain that a little bit. So it's amazing that after Hamas did the incursion on October 7th, by the way, they exhibited some core competencies like paragliding that isn't really indigenous to 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 Gaza and Hamas. So you gotta you gotta wonder where they got those capabilities, right? And so, but you immediately saw Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, Kataib uh, Hezbollah in Syria. You saw the the Badr organization in Iraq uh, with with uh, diplomatic initiatives in the Iraqi parliament to oust all the remaining U.S. troops uh, within Iraq. And you saw the Houthis uh, starting to implement, you know, cruise missiles, anti ship ballistic missiles. You know, where does that core competency come from? So this this was an orchestra, and they all did it within within days of each other. Okay, so you got to think that there was some coordination with all these to push um, those goalposts, as I mentioned, in favor of where the Iranians wanted to go, short of general conflict. Okay, short of general conflict, because that's not not in their interest. And so we immediately, uh, as you as you mentioned, Jeff, we brought a lot of forces in the area. The mission set for our forces was simply to isolate the conflict to Gaza. That's a good mission set, but really we're struggling with how do we deal with this, with the other proxies and the activities that they're doing, particularly since they're they're aiming at Americans, particularly Qatar, Hezbollah in Syria, going after the basing in Iraq and in, in Syria, that's a force protection issue. And the, the attacking of uh, the commercial vessels in the Bab el uh, Mandeb and the approaches within the Red Sea, that's the new level of, of uh, proxy activity that, that we ha haven't seen before. And so it's really going to be important to react to that. I think a defensive only posture is, is probably a mistake because that's just going to empower them to do more. So we really have to design a campaign to go after those key enabling capabilities emanating from Iran, frankly, um, that would that separate Iran from the proxies, separate the command and control in order to uh, send a message um, and to and to de de uh, escalate and and, and de um, or eliminate their capacity to wage that kind of warfare. So that's a different level uh, that that we're seeing, and we we need to figure out a way with the forces that we have in theater that we brought over there with that mission set to be able to go after it. And I think that's the that that's the, and we'll talk about it in a little bit where Soft may be able to uh, engage in that. You've mentioned several non-state actors now, and you know the relationship of the United States. Does this mean that the U.S. is back in the Middle East, um, Dr. DiGiorgio? Because really, you know, based on your experience too, uh, certainly in the Navy and with a lot of years of experience um, in the Middle East, the whole, what we thought was the point of GPC was that the U.S. was going to focus on other regions. And more particularly, we have the largest land war in Europe since the Second World War with uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, there's the concern about Chinese escalation towards Taiwan. And so there was already tremendous concern as far as the ability of the United States to focus on two different theaters. And this was uh, Europe and Asia. But now it looks like we're back to focusing on the Middle East. I, I don't I don't think we're going to be back in a big way. I think uh, at least not now. OK, because if you take a look of, of what we tried to do, particularly in 2006 with the surge in Iraq and then with the surge against ISIS, what happened was we tried to to uh, selectively uh, disable uh, the, the, those terrorist networks ability to conduct activities. It wasn't working very well. We had to go in with general purpose forces uh, to get that done. If we tried to do that here, there are so many of those proxies, it would be overwhelming. I think I think the better strategy would be to try to isolate and disable those proxies from the source that's uh, that's that's enabling them. And that and that is Iran logistically with command control, uh, even with the, the use of cyber tools. We need to isolate the proxies from uh, Iran 
to to bring that uh, to to a measured uh, uh, and, and a, a new norm uh, in the area. At the same time, we eliminate the immediate threat to Israel. Uh, maintain Israel as a as a mainstay ally in the in the region uh, as we reduce the threat to our lines of communication into the area. That that's the better approach. That's a limited approach. That, that that'll take limited resources. But I think a surge now to go after the proxy is a huge mistake. There's too many of them. Um, it's too big. It's too long of a conflict. Um, and the price to to pay for that, particularly since we're engaged uh, with Ukraine as well, I think would be overwhelming. And to bring a, a, another angle at this, um, and certainly this speaks to Mr. Kaludi's experience, but we're looking again specifically at non-state proxies, uh, particularly in the Middle East. And then when you talk about the humanitarian catastrophe as it's evolving um, in the Gaza Strip, but there's a, a tie-in when it comes to information and ideology here, as far as the non-state actors um, in the Middle East, and then uh, perhaps that the, the conflict has breathed life back into this Islamist fundamentalism, and we're seeing a uh, human humanitarian catastrophe in Darfur. Um, Nigerian Christians are being killed uh, by Boko Haram, ISIS offshoots. So there's a room, in other words, perhaps for not just military support, but humanitarian intervention, uh, humanitarian measures that can also perhaps uh, eviscerate this ideology. So, you, Mr. Cloutier, what do you think the role is for non-military force and uh, striking at the message and the the symptoms um, or the the disease rather than the symptoms that create and breathe life into these extremist non-state organizations? Mm. Um, it's uh, it's a great question, and you know, I think it come. I I think the upstream factor often deals with the the, the home state politics. Um, and so, you know, Israel's Israel's posture with with more civilian uh, deaths taking place continues to take center stage. And there's, you know, a push for greater concentration, civ mill concentration on humanitarian aid. But really, you know, these are these are external forces acting on, uh, you know, on 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 domestic soil. So, how can those how can those be prevented? I think we've heard some some light touch on the fact that you know an end state hasn't really materialized in in the public from uh, from Iraqi leadership, and uh, you know, without that, it leaves question marks um, all over the place um, in terms of. Uh, in terms of that balance between you know what's going on with uh, with with civilian um, with civilian casualties or deaths um, in relation to this this premise that without doing so without going after uh, without going the militants in in the within the population this this notion of urban warfare that we are the one then then they will be casualties on on our side of the equation so you know these are things that uh, civil society organizations within the countries within the populations can help resolve to help educate um beyond what the facts you know are or are being portrayed as um and so uh, you know i'll stop there in the post conflict conflict countries where i've in, in which i've worked I mean, these are some of the most fundamental things that that we do with uh, with USAID, with the United Nations, and 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 with our partner and ally, uh, cooperation or development agencies. And Dr. Goswami, you've also done similar research on conflict resolution and non-state actors. So, where do you see this conflict heading as far as its ability to, you know, once again rejuvenate? Um, the some one of the concerns, which is a radical ideology that we thought perhaps um, we had at least somewhat contained with the campaign against ISIS uh, as a culmination before um, the U.S. largely withdrew itself from the Middle East. So are we headed back towards more and more of these regional fires, including the humanitarian catastrophe and the displacement and migration that results from it? So if you if I look at my own research in terms of how conflict resolution works, one thing which is really important for any conflict resolution process is to be very realistic about what the ideology of a particular group is, right? So understand that, what is the belief system? So if you look at Hamas's uh, different releases in terms of their own ideology and belief system, they see themselves as a violent resistance group. 
So in their context, including the fact that they are now distancing themselves from their original founding from the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, they talk about uh, violent resistance against the state of Israel. So first of all, is it possible for a state, for a non-state actor like that, which views violence as a means to achieve a particular end goal, which is a Palestinian state, to actually change that, right? That's the first thing. So in my research, what, what that would require, and that's, I think, the first key question. And you see that in terms of the Houthis and Iran uh, and Hezbollah. They also have a very similar stand. And so, in fact, what was concerning to me was that the Houthis were actually losing public support in Yemen after their attacks on the Red Sea on Israeli-connected commercial shipping. Recruitment to them has increased. And so you see that there is that particular context which we have to keep in mind when we think about post-conflict uh, and in terms of resolution. One, is it possible to change or have some kind of shift in the leadership belief system? And I studied this in terms of violent conflict, say in uh, the Burma-India borders, and there have been groups who have been engaged in extreme levels of violence for about 25 years, then having dealt with uh, a response by the state and other uh, collaborative efforts by civil society, and that's why I think the role of civil society really matters, uh, there was a change of heart, right? So that's number one. Number two is that in today's context, given the fact that there is, of course, disproportionate use of violence in response to what happened. So if you look at the conversations globally, the word disproportionate, the word legitimate, is this how uh, Israel can actually achieve some of its strategic objective of securing itself by the use of a uh, disproportionate response to acts of violence? Will that work? In that context, it'll really require the collaboration of not just the United States, Israel, uh, some of the regional actors, but also civil society groups in terms of if this is at all possible. And finally, I think most importantly, in the context of today, I do not see, uh, and I, I'm going to be realistic here, uh, and given the fact that I've studied so many of the armed groups in the world, what I notice is that if the armed group itself, first of all, does not change its ideology, continues to arm itself, continues to innovate and adapt to counter any kind of attack on itself. You see Hamas innovating, use of technology, uh, the fact that they're now you have uh, Chinese weapons that have been found in some of Hamas's, uh, you know, uh, in, in their possession. The, the fact that they have innovated to the level that it feels like a special forces operations and have promised to do it again. So in that context, post-conflict seems difficult and very challenging in my in my estimation. And because the conflict is so live, uh, is it really realistic to think about how a post-conflict situation will work out? We have done this so many times, a two-state solution, nations support that. Uh, who is going to be the mediator? All that matters in the post-conflict scenario. You know, when you talk about the conflict, this again goes to, you know, I mentioned in the beginning tunnel vision, and it, no pun intended, that was just what came to mind, because there's the concern that the U.S. has had strategic tunnel vision before great power competition, as far as in the Middle East, and then tactical tunnel vision insofar as uh, counterterrorism type operations, really uh, consuming uh, U.S. military focus. But one of the things that we're eliciting from this conversation is just how many different strands we're tugging at here in terms of conflict, competition, and warfare. And so looking at it, you mentioned the word, Dr. Goswami, uh, disproportionate. And we're thinking about, this is that tunnel vision, you know, we're thinking about the campaign, for instance, against ISIS and, you know, having to, how do you use munitions and conduct urban warfare? But for special operations, and particularly in that shift from global war on terror strategic tunnel vision to now this wider view of great power competition, how do you see the current role uh, for special operations either changing or responding to what we're seeing in the Israel-Hamas war? And, and again, you know, we can talk about the, the tactical aspects of the war, but really what this conversation has already spoken to is uh, 
much broader roles for special operations. So Dr. DiOrio, based on your military experience and uh, research in special operations, what should SOF be learning from this war? So uh, the first thing, big picture, is that uh, this is classic asymmetric gray zone conflict, okay? And we're gonna be in that kind of conflict for, for the long haul. And that's where our war fighting capabilities need to be finely tuned. Our tactics, techniques, and procedures need to be able to function uh, well in, in, in that environment. It's, it's typically population centric, right? Because there, there's no separation out of, of the population. That's right, by the way, that's right in the special forces uh, bailiwick, but, but it is an adaptation of, of, uh, of irregular warfare. But that we're gonna be in there uh, for, for the long haul. So we need to be able to, uh, prior to conflict, um, uh, build partnership capacity uh, which is to get a, a is to try to build connections with given populations that may be affected um, to to use that as leverage to prevent conflict. Then during the conflict, we need to um, have our special operating forces be able to in a supporting role, not a lead role, because then the populations identify with the U.S. instead of their their own governments, which which we've seen can can be a disaster as well. But we need to build that partnership capacity and supporting role in order to uh, promote uh, governance systems um, and uh, democratic as opposed to autocratic or theocratic uh, governance systems that, that are aligned with us. And then, um, as we've talked about, is the post-conflict, which is then reconnecting the population to whatever governance system uh, would, will come to play. And that's that's the civil affairs, uh, again, uh, for special operators, that, that that's a supporting role, but that's a conflict stabilization piece that I, that I think that uh, our special operators can contribute in as well. So if you take a look uh, within the the whole spectrum of conflict before, during, and after, our special operators can engage in, e in each one of those uh, in a particular way um, and, 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 be, and be effective. And that's not to say we don't need the general purpose forces. Of course we do, because they'll come into play. And sometimes the, the special operations uh, would be in a supporting role to the general purpose forces, uh, particularly, I mean, what we have going on right now with the amphibious a baton amphibious response group in the Red Sea, which is there to protect Americans, right? I mean, their whole mission set is to wherever possible, whether it's a non-combatant evacuation uh, operation or to go in to protect an embassy or to help uh, bring the hostages uh, back out again, um, the special operations forces in, in a supporting role or even in a direct role would be uh, would be involved with that. But but those are those are limited conflict, right? That, 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 that those aren't tank against tank, conventional against conventional uh, uh, type uh, scenarios. Th those are very much um, in the in the asymmetric. Um, and as Professor Goswami was talking about, in a proportional way, right? Because you don't you don't want to. You don't want to uh, get into an area where you're engaging in any one of those areas and unintentionally escalate the conflict. And so there's a little bit of an operational art uh, to that as well. But that's where I see the uh, special operations engaging. So it sounds like what you're saying, Dr. Diorio, is there's room for an interagency process here as well, a relationship between SOF and interagency uh, partners in both pre, during, and then post-conflict resolution to build resilience into civil institutions. So Mr. Cloutier, could you perhaps talk based on your experience of a role for interagency partners to work with SOF um, ahead of, during, and then after conflicts like the current one that we're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, with, I've, I've written about this uh, in 2023 even that, you know, SOF and the preventative side of the equation and really, and I'm not talking about American soft here, I'm talking about the host country special operations equivalent that are often missing from the table when these early signs of conflict are emerging, whether they be food related, whether they be water related, whether they be ethnic con uh, conflict, whatever, the, whatever those basic human needs that tend to sprout up that aren't being satisfied, those tables, number one, tend to be filled with externals and number two, they rarely have the Ministry of Defense point person sitting there. So even when they do have a Ministry of Defense point person sitting there, are they equipped to talk about the, the, the realms of engagement that, that, that uh, Dr. DiOrio was just talking about? 
And so, you know, that's the opportunity that I think a lot of us are talking about now is in this modern era of special operations, you know, how do you leverage that expertise and experience from the counterterrorism area, which hasn't gone away, but a lot of expertise and experience was developed. And we're just coming off of the collegiate national football championship game just a couple of days ago, right? I mean, to go march down the fit, the field and score that touchdown at the end of a drive, all of those elements of special operations are required for that director kinetic act activity at the end. So the question is, you know, can that spearhead be adjusted at the end? And so the convening role of being able to share that ex expertise and experience with the host country uh, defense practitioners themselves is of, of, of huge value. And we've see, we're seeing that in the national security strategy talking about over and over again, extensively, allies and partners, by, with, and through, pulling that from the special, uh, special operations vernacular. Um, I think like Dr. Viorio was talking about before, I mean, we cannot address each of these interventions one by one. It's not going to work. I mean, our NSS says that. And so how that by, with, and through all of a sudden becomes less sort of rhetorical and more of something that we need to really strategically put into action. So I'll stop there. And what you're mentioning, yes, of course. Yeah, Dr. Goswami, um, this goes to your expertise in integrated deterrence. So uh, please, um, if you could, where do you see the role of international partners in building this uh, robustness and resilience for for pre-conflict and post-conflict resolution? Yeah, so before I answer that, I would say that uh, the question you posed about the role of what, what should special operations learn from this or how can they, I think the lessons that are extremely vital to learn is the use of technology by Hamas and the use of technology cumulatively, which is a uh, something that took Israel by surprise as well. Despite the fact that Israel has established uh, the idea of DEFCOR, which is about special operations within enemy territory, in pursuance of a very conventional goal, which is basically the uh, complete uh, annihilation or destruction of the adversary, right? So with the Dahia concept. So within that context, I think one of the lessons I sometimes think is misunderstood is that there are assertions made that uh, groups like Hezbollah, Hamas has learned lessons from, say, Russia, Ukraine, but actually it's the other way around. Russia, Ukraine, after observing non-state actors like the Islamic State, Taliban use of drone technology, the quadcopters that they use, sworn technology, the Houthis are using that, have learned lessons from them. So I think that's a big context and we need to frame that correctly because these non-state actors, I remember uh, listening to a presentation 10 years ago uh, in Rome, where the presenter pointed out that one of the futures we need to be very careful, especially even for special operations, is to understand how non-state armed actors are going to use cumulative technology and actually instigate very suicide bombing-like attacks by using drones and predator drones. And this was 10 years ago. And this kind of insight was not really understood at that time. There was skepticism and here we are with the October 7 attack. So that's, I think, a vital lesson to understand that these actors are, first of all, as you talked about international partnership, have international partners themselves. For example, Iran supporting them, uh, as you see with technology, with uh, drones, with uh, even with doctrine, uh, if you see their training, right? And then they are also able to get help from other uh, including non-state actors. And then finally, the biggest lesson is the use of internet communication, the use of, actually, we talk about people-centric approach. But one thing that Hamas has really understood well is that what the Palestinians living in Gaza Strip, 2.1 million, wanted was a governance system with social welfare and the ability to survive and be secure, yet by supporting an ideology that wanted a separate state. And so they have been in Gaza since uh, in Gaza, sorry, since 2007, if I remember right. And so they are in the governance mechanism, right? So that is a big lesson to learn for special operations that if you want to be people centric, first of all, you have to understand that the adversary is changing. The adversary understands this, that their um, their uh, movement has to have legitimacy and people support and they build it. 
And then finally, if you see how they innovated, even in terms of responding to Israel's own defense capability, right? I mean, Israel has built a 40 mile long barrier, which cost a billion dollars, upgraded that in 2021, included cameras, radars and sensors. And guess what Hamas did? They use commercial quadcopter drones, use explosives to attack those observation towers and to build a 30 point of, uh, you know, intrusion in the wall. So these are the lessons. I mean, these are groups that are innovating and using precision navigation guidance missiles to attack. You see this with Hamas strategy. So I think the biggest lesson is, first of all, ideological people-centric, that they are also focusing on being people-centric. If you see the interviews they are giving to the media, it's about showing the word disproportionate use, use again and again in Arabic. So I think that's what special operation needs to learn, that this is a very complex adversary you're dealing with, with population support in the areas that they are, and that's a vital lesson to learn. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Diorio, what Dr. Goswami speaks to is the military's ability to uh, study, learn from, and then rather than react, uh, preempt, or perhaps be prepared for what per might look to be unforeseeable conflicts. Um, certainly, I think on October 6th, it was not really on the U.S. bingo card that there would be a major conflict to happen in the Middle East that would really uh, profoundly affect our attention as far as it's related to those two larger theaters we had spoken about, or per per perceptively the larger theaters we had spoken about, Europe and Asia. So speaking more to, rather than just looking at how the U.S. or U.S. Special Operations Forces can react, um, how do they prepare themselves, rather, uh, you know, through conversations like this, but how do they prepare themselves for the future? What, what, a, what a great question. And I couldn't agree more with the professor's assessment of, of how uh, the proxies in particular were able to, with very low cost, uh, innovative ideas, really put us back a bit. And we, we really weren't prepared for that. What a great lesson to be able to, to try to stay ahead of that. I mean, I'll add, uh, before I answer your question, Jeff, which is a good one, I'll add, uh, you know, think about some of the th other things that have transpired. We, we are really, we're shooting down $10,000 drones with $2 million plus missiles. Sometimes the standard six is a $6 million missile. Okay, so one of the key objectives of Iran is to run us out of money. Okay. Particularly since we're engaged with Ukraine, they thought it was a perfect time to, to, to do that, and we're falling right into that trap. We need to learn how to preempt those kind of low-cost uh, uh, asymmetric capabilities, particularly in the cyber domain. The other thing worth mentioning, um, and uh, we, we see a little some signs of, of Chinese influence here too, of the use of cy very inexpensive cyber tools to attack infrastructure within the United States, almost like probing uh, for, for the next level of, of warfare when it comes time for them to shift the goalpost again. So we need to prepare against that too. The other thing worth mentioning is the information warfare, okay? There's no, there, you know, you have to uh, believe that the, the Iranians wanted to advance the, the strategic narrative, their strategic narrative, that this is the, the, you know, the West are the oppressors. Palestinians in particular, they are the victims. Muslim community in general are the victims. And so the Iranians come in as the knight in shining armor to be the champion of the those that, that, that are victims. And they put out the strategic narrative to do that. You can only think that a lot of this, uh, these protests, these pro-Palestinian uh, pro uh, protests are born from that kind of a narrative for one reason or another, and there's a lot of different reasons for that, but that's kind of the same narrative. It doesn't, doesn't matter how the victim engages in the warfare, you know, what kind of brutality Hamas went after. The, the bottom line is it's an oppressor against a victim. It's the, the, the big boy against the, the, the oppressed. And that's what's gaining traction. And that narrative was being professed at very, particularly low cost from the Iranians. So, so how do you, from a warfare perspective, I mean, how do you 
How do you fight against that? Those are the lessons that we that we need to take a look at. And and back to Peter's point, that that that's a that's a whole of government. That's an interagency um, kind of deal. I mean, whether it's State Department and a Global Engagement Center for putting out counter narratives, very difficult for us to do, um, particularly since we're the you know, especially if you believe that we are the oppressor. And so so, but those are the lessons that we 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 have to take forward. And I think special operations is part of that. I think that they would help being on the ground, certainly uh, in combination with the country teams uh, in the, the area that they're in, in order to promote positive narratives and capabilities to guard against that, I think, I think is a great lesson.